back, but she had a couple more, couple walks earlier today. So I'm just gonna go in and find her. Can you hear her? I'm gonna go find her. I love coming home because Lily is always so excited to see me when I get home. <gasps> Can you see her? There she is. Can you hear her? There's Lily barking. Oh, Lily looks excited. Oh, look at her tail. All right, Lily, I have to unlock the door. Lily knows. Oop. Unlock the door. Lily! Lily, hi! <laughs> Lily's very excited. Would you like a treat, Lily? Would you like a treat, sit? Good girl. Good girl, gentle mouth. Oh, good girl. Do you have a dog at home? Or maybe another pet? Somebody who really likes to see you when they come home? The story of Jesus today is about Jesus coming through a locked door to see his friends. But Jesus didn't have to use a key and he didn't give the disciples doggy treats. No, instead he brought them two things. He brought them peace and he brought them the good news of his resurrection. The fact that he rose from the dead. He gave them the breath of the Holy Spirit and they were as happy as Lily was when she just got to see us. Can we, would you pray with me? Dear friends, thank you for pups. Thank you for doors that open. Thank you for Jesus who came to bring his friends peace, the Holy Spirit, good life, and good news. We pray all these things in your son Jesus' precious name. Amen. Good morning, friends at Newcastle Presbyterian Church. My name is Shannon Hansen, and I have the distinct honor and privilege of sharing our scripture today from John with you. I want to just thank you again for this opportunity and uh, say that I have so enjoyed in the past worshiping with all of you, and this is an opportunity to do so as well, just virtually. So let us begin. About a decade ago, I attended a cousin's wedding in Louisiana. And we stayed at my uncle's lake home, which is right on the Texas-Louisiana border near the town of Uncertain, Texas. You have to wonder who came up with that name, don't you? Uncertain, Texas. But it's true, it's a real place, you can look it up. Um, population in 2018 was about 59 people. Um, uncertain. And on the way to the wedding, we were passing uncertain, and I abruptly st stopped the car. I was driving, and I abruptly stopped the car because I had seen a sign, a sign from God. And here it is. That's right, the sign. Can you see it? Church of Uncertain. Church of Uncertain right there. And as you may be able to see, the sky on that day was partly cloudy over here and partly sunny, which only added to the overall effect of the sign and the day. And as soon as I saw this sign, I knew I'd use it in a sermon someday. And that day has now come. That day's today, in fact, because we're all living in uncertain, frankly. We're all living in uncertain right now, and that makes this morning scripture lesson and scripture reading from the book of John particularly apt. So let's set the scene, shall we? When this passage opens, it's the first Easter Sunday night, right? The first Easter Sunday night. Just that morning, John tells us, there were three people who had learned the miraculous news of Jesus' resurrection, his victory over death. There was Peter. There was the disciple whom Jesus loved. We don't hear his name. And then there was Mary Magdalene. Now, we don't know what Peter thought, but we certainly learned from John that the other disciple saw and believed the empty tomb, and that Mary, too, went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them all that she had seen and heard from Jesus 
that morning. All right, so that's in the morning, shortly before dawn. Go through the day, and now it is the nighttime, the night of that same day. And John tells us that the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked. And they were specifically locked because of fear of the Jews. And can you blame them? I sort of picture the disciples huddled in the upper room. Maybe they were speaking in whispers, afraid that the sound of their voices might give them away to the authorities. And if those folks in power had killed Jesus, well, you can pretty much guess what was coming their way, right? Now you might be wondering, I certainly was wondering when I read it, this text again, well, at least two of them saw the empty tomb and all of them, all of the disciples there had heard from Mary that she had seen the Lord and, and wouldn't, that was just that same day, wouldn't that count for something? Well, maybe. But I think it counts for something because we know the rest of the story. We know the rest of this story. And the disciples, they didn't. They don't. You see, instead of focusing on the rest of the story, the disciples were there in this, in, gathered together behind a locked door, self-quarantining against feared enemies on the outside. And then in walks Jesus through that door. The text tells us he came and he stood among them. And two times he offers them his peace. And then he breathed the Holy Spirit into them. Just breathed it into them and gave them a purpose. As my father sent me, I am sending you. Go, go and tell, tell all this good news to others. And John tells us that the disciples' reaction to this was just, was rejoicing. They were overjoyed where there had been so much fear. Now they had hope and a purpose. That is all of them except one. You see, because while 10 of the 11 disciples were huddled together behind a closed door, one was not. Thomas wasn't among them. I guess I like to think of Thomas as maybe being the one they sent out wearing a mask to go to the food line or the Acme and get food for the group for the evening. Maybe Thomas wasn't there because he sort of had enough of being around other people and he needed a little space. He needed to get away from folks. Maybe he needed to process everything that he had heard about that, that day, earlier in the morning. Maybe it was something else. But either way, no matter where he was or why he was away, he wasn't there. And when he gets back inside the disciples, this is the first person that they get to tell. They are just so eager to tell their story about what happened, to tell Thomas the good news. Hey, Thomas, we have seen the Lord. Just like Mary Magdalene did this morning, we've seen him. But Thomas isn't exactly on board. You see, Thomas wants proof. Unless I can see the marks of the crucifixion on his hands, Unless I can feel the wound in his side, no dice. I'm not going to believe. We find Thomas sitting right in the very front pew of the Church of Uncertain. And I got to tell you, I can so relate to him. I can so relate to Thomas's doubt. That unseen hope that the disciples are talking about, that's, that's just too good to be true, right? See, the reality of Jesus' death, Thomas is thinking, a reality of that, I saw that. Our isolation and our fear of the future and our fear of what, what's outside, oh yeah, I've experienced that. 
the resurrection, new life when all around us is death and despair for the future, I'll believe it when I see it. I'll believe it when I see it, Thomas told his fellow disciples. But Thomas didn't stay that way because one week later, John tells us that Jesus comes back, back through another closed door and he offers Thomas peace. And he offers Thomas direct evidence of who he is. The opportunity to see him and to touch him, to feel and experience. And he gently tells Thomas, don't doubt, but believe. And this time Thomas takes Jesus up on it. My Lord and my God, Thomas says. My Lord and my God. Can you hear the relief in Thomas's words? The removal of wearying doubt and disappointment, the clearing away of confusion and concern. Can you hear it? My Lord and my God. And then can you see the disciples standing around and seeing saying, see Thomas, we told you, we told you. And then Jesus quieting them all, quieting them all down and saying, you have a job to do, folks. You have to go and tell others the good news of resurrection. But, he says, the disciples won't be able to rely on a, I'll believe it when I see it kind of situation. No. Instead, Jesus specifically tells Thomas, well, he asks him a question first, and then he tells him, the question is, have you believed because you've seen me? And then he says, blessed are those, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. And folks, we are those blessed ones, those who have come to believe but I surely don't think we haven't seen. I believe that a tangible, personal experience of the risen Christ is available through the hands and feet of Christ followers here in Newcastle County, Delaware, in the community at Newcastle Presbyterian Church. I've experienced it through you in the warm welcome you've afforded me when I've preached at that beautiful sanctuary of yours. I've experienced it in your smiles, in your kindness. We're in a tough time right now. We're physically separated from others. We feel alone, we feel isolated. Many, maybe many of us are wrestling with questions of doubt questions of pain or suffering, wondering about a future that doesn't look like our past. I'll tell you, it's during uncertain times, uncertain times such as these, during true struggles, that we as Christ followers are so privileged, so blessed to rely on Jesus to lean in to our faith, knowing that Jesus will meet us even behind the doors that are closed and padlocked with anxiety. And Jesus will grant us peace and breathe new life into our dark places. See, as Christ followers, we are people of hope. We are charged with proclaiming the promise and the power, the promise and the power of resurrection through our personal experiences of the risen Christ. This week, this week may each of us find ways to show others the reason for our hope. Let our lives speak. 
He is risen indeed. Amen. Amen.